So how creative are you when it comes to solving the problems that you're faced with? Uh, Mr. Bean had a very uh, precarious situation he created to solve his problem. I'm inspired by him. I like to come up with creative solutions and stuff. I don't think I would probably be that precarious, though, in driving on the top of a car, but it was entertaining to watch. I want to say welcome to you. Thanks for joining us on our online service today. And um, if you've been tuning in in the past, I hope that you found that you're gaining value by tuning in and being online. And I also want to say thank you to you if you've been getting the word out and spreading the word about our online services, because really our goal is to add value to the lives of people. And the more people that tune in, the more value we're able to add to more people's lives. In fact, when we put together our online experience, that's really the question we're asking is, how can we add value to the lives of people? We want to give you something that you can use for the rest of the week. And that's why we're in our current series. We're actually in part three today of Rise, Turning Adversity into Advantage. And in fact, today's topic is turning obstacles into opportunities. Much like last week where we talked about redefining failure, I believe today that we need to change our perspective on how we view obstacles, much like failure. We kind of have the wrong look outlook on what failure is. I think we kind of have the wrong outlook on what op- obstacles are in our life. We've got to kind of change that, reframe that. I believe obstacles are an inevitable part of our life. They're a fact of life. You can't avoid them. You can't get rid of them. In fact, Frank A. Clark says that if you can find a path with no obstacles, it probably doesn't lead anywhere. And I couldn't agree more. The obstacles are part of the pathway of life that we have to go down. As we talk about this idea of turning obstacles into opportunity, I want to focus in on the story from the Bible. Back in the very beginning of the Bible, in the first book in Genesis, there's a story about a guy by the name of Joseph. And I want to read to you um, from Genesis chapter 37, verse 24, where we kind of pick up on Joseph's story because Joseph's life was fraught with obstacles. And it says this, When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Now, Joseph was 17 years old. I think that's important to note at this point in the story. And it's also important to note that he was a little bit of a tattletale. A little goody two-shoes was always telling on his brothers to his dad about what they were doing. And Joseph was considered to be his favorite son. He made that very clear with his brothers, which actually made his brothers very jealous of him. And so they actually came up with this plan to um, have Joseph, basically, they, they basically apprehended him and they sold him into a slave trade to a group of, a band of people that were coming by while they were out uh, tending their flock. And then they took his, his favorite coat that his dad had given to him as a gift. They dipped it in goat's blood and came back to their dad and said, we don't know what happened, but we found his coat. It must have been a wild animal. So they basically got Jacob not looking for his son, thinking his son is dead, while his son, meanwhile, has been sold to a band of people that are traveling through the area as a slave. And so you follow Joseph's story. That's kind of the first obstacle. As you go along with his story, you find that he's eventually sold uh, into the slavery, into the servant uh, service of a guy by the name of, of Potiphar, who is the captain of the king's guard, um, captain of Pharaoh's guard. Pharaoh was the ruler of the land of Egypt. And so Joseph was made a slave in his household and he found favor with Potiphar. And so he kind of rose up the ranks and became the guy who really managed all of Potiphar's affairs. Everything was going great. Until Potiphar's wife, who the Bible describes Joseph as being a strapping young lad who is very uh, handsome, and Potiphar's wife begins to be attracted to him, and she wants to sleep with him, and she makes that known to him, and she's very forceful with him to the tune that Joseph, she grabs a hold of Joseph, and the only way that Joseph could get away from her was to slip out of his outer robe and run away. And Potiphar's wife did not take too kindly to that, so she went to her husband and said, that guy you hired to, to, uh, to manage our household is, is making me look like a fool. He tried to rape me. And so, you know, Potiphar, who are you going to believe? The slave, the servant who's running your household, or your wife? And he believes his wife, sides with his wife, and Joseph gets thrown into prison. So obstacle after obstacle gets faced in front of him. He's in prison for uh, a number of, uh, a bit of time. And then the pharaoh of Egypt, the, the leader of Egypt, puts two guys that were in his service into prison as well that he was not happy with, the baker and the butler. And they're in prison with Joseph, and either each one of them, while in prison, end up having a dream that Joseph interprets. For the baker, it's not so good. He interprets that in three days, the baker is going to lose his life. He's going to be, be executed. And in three days, the butler is going to be restored to his former duties of being the butler for a pharaoh. And so Joseph says to the butler, he says, when you get back and restored into your position, would you um, put a good word in for me with the Pharaoh and remember me being here? I, you know, maybe I can get out of, of prison. Well, the butler gets returned, restored to his former glory. He's so excited about what happens that he completely spaces out, forgets about Joseph, until three years later, the Pharaoh of Egypt wakes up in the middle of the night, 
twice with two very disturbing dreams that just, you know, have you ever had one of those dreams that you just can't go back to sleep? He has two disturbing dreams and he wants to know what they mean. And so he calls in all of his magicians and all the people, the wise people that are in his service and asks them to interpret his dreams. And none of them can do that. And so he says, is there anybody who can interpret my dreams? And at that point in time, the butler, a light bulb comes on. He remembers three years ago, I was in prison and this guy, Joseph, interpreted my dreams. So he says that to Pharaoh. Pharaoh summons for Joseph. Joseph comes into um, Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh shares his dreams with him. And Joseph says, I can't interpret them, but God can. And he goes through and basically he says, you know, your, your first dream is saying that there's going to be a, a lot of the seven years of prosperity in the land of Egypt. And the second dream is, gonna, is saying that there's going to be seven years of severe famine in the land of Egypt. That is, that is so great that uh, we've never seen anything like it before. And so Joseph comes up with a solution for what they're going to do to be able to survive this famine that's about to come. And Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge. In fact, he puts him in second command under himself of the entire land of Egypt to basically manage his affairs for the whole nation. And so through the process of Joseph going through these obstacles, we see him actually come out victorious on the other side of them. And I want to take that, that last obstacle that he was faced with, interpreting Pharaoh's dream and there's this problem that Egypt's going to be faced with, and how do they handle that situation? And I want to unpack that, because I believe there's four steps that we can learn for how we can turn obstacles in our lives into opportunities based on this story. And so the first step is very, very simple, very obvious, and that is this, identify your obstacle. The first thing you need to do is to identify your obstacle. It's not rocket science. It seems so basic, and yet we have to do that. We have to know what it is that we're facing before we know how to solve what we're facing. Many times our obstacles are just a problem to solve. And if we can identify what that problem is, it allows us to be able to maybe come up with a way to, to move forward. Sometimes our problems, by the way, aren't what we think they are. And sometimes we have to dive a little deeper. I, I think of current situation with um, us all being uh, at home, stay, stay, stay home, stay safe, or stay, stay safe, stay healthy. And we're all at home together, my whole family. I've got my wife and my two daughters that are home and instead of my girls going to school every day, they're at home doing their homework and their chores and all that kind of stuff. And that's made my life very, very challenging in terms of being able to get my job done. And so I could say the problem I'm faced with is my kids are home from school. <clears throat> but is that really the problem? Why is that an issue for me? Well, it's not that my kids are bad. My kids are doing great. But the fact that they're home means more activity, more distraction. And those distractions mean less productivity for me. So the real problem isn't that my kids are home from school. It's not how can I get my kids away from me. My real problem is how can I be more productive and not have these distractions that are causing me to not get done the things I need to get done. And so that's the real problem. That's the thing I need to focus on. And a lot of times in our life, the problem that we think is, is not really the problem. There's a deeper problem. You've got to dive in and figure out what that is. And realize this, that naming our problems takes the power away from them. We've got to name our problems because once we know what they are, they're not so big and so insurmountable like we might think they are. Joseph named Egypt's problem. In fact, in Genesis 41.30, it's recorded, this is what Joseph says. He says, there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. See, Joseph originally says there's going to be seven years of so much prosperity in Egypt. The crops are going to be great. Everything's going to be wonderful. But then the famine that, that follows those seven years of prosperity is going to be so bad that in those seven years, we'll completely forget about the prosperity that Egypt had in the seven years prior. So that's the problem. He identified what it was. Now, I want to ask you, what is your current obstacle that you're faced with? I have a worksheet that's included in your notes. And in fact, in the notes section, there's a, a plot, spot rather where you can actually click a link and pull up a PDF and download the notes. And I encourage you to do that because on the backside, the second page of your notes is a little worksheet for you to be able to work through the obstacles that you're faced with to kind of go through the steps that we're talking about today. And so I encourage you to pull that out, at least look at it for now. Maybe you can start working through this now. Maybe you can do it later on today, but I encourage you at some time today to go through this worksheet. But the question I ask on here is, what is an obstacle that I'm currently faced with? And I'm talking about the real obstacle, not the, the perceived one, but the real obstacle. If you really ask the question, what is it that my problem really is right now? Can you name it? And if you can, then I want you to write that into that worksheet. That's the first step. And then we're going to come back to that. So once you've clearly identified your problem, the next step is to find a solution. Find a solution. When Joseph named Egypt's, Egypt's problem, which they're going to have this famine, he didn't skip a beat in an offering a solution. He went right in from here's your problem to here's a, a, a way I think we could solve the problem. So here was Joseph's solution in Genesis 41. He says, Appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. 
That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. See, Joseph's suggestion for this solution was really quite simple, and yet it had a very profound effect. It was a very effective in terms of executing it. I want to point out, by the way, too, that when it comes to solving the problems in your life, there's often multiple solutions to solve your problem. And, sol- and options, by the way, when it comes to problem solving, are our friends. Think of multiple ways that you can solve your current problems. I'm going to go back to the worksheet and point out to you in that second section there, find a solution is step two. What are three possible solutions to overcoming this obstacle? So you named your obstacle in step one. Now I want you to ask yourself the question, what are at least three solutions that I can come up with to solve that problem? Maybe all of them aren't the best solutions, but, but at least get three solutions that you can come up with that problem so you have some options as it, as it, in regards to solving your problem. Then that if, once you've identified your obstacle and you've brainstormed some possible solutions, that moves us to step three, which is this. Take action. Step three is to take action. Most people are able to name their problems, and a lot of people are even able to come up with some solutions to their problem, but step three is where most people get tripped up. That's where they stop. And so um, Zig Ziglar says this. He says when it comes to obstacles, he says, when obstacles arise, you change your direction to reach your goal. You do not change your decision to get there. And a lot of times what happens is once we have identified our obstacle, and we've come up with some possible solutions for it, we just stop right there. We don't actually move forward and follow through by taking action. You have to take action or you do no good. Consider this. Sometimes obstacles are put in our way to see if what we really want is worth fighting for. Think about that. And by the way, um, op- or options are, or, or, I'm sorry, um, we, we need to realize that obstacles only remain obstacles if we don't push through them. You think of a person who's running track and field, the hurdles that they jump over, they still remain in front of their path until they've jumped over. But once they've jumped over that hurdle, it's no longer an obstacle for them. And now they can focus their attention on the next hurdle on the road ahead. The same is true for us. Orison Sweat Martin says, most of our obstacles would melt away if instead of cowering before them, we should make up our minds to walk boldly through them. And that's something we need to do. We've got to boldly walk through our obstacles. How did Joseph take action in this story? We're following the story of Joseph. In step three, Genesis says this, that Joseph took charge, and when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. See, Joseph went right into action. As soon as uh, Pharaoh appointed him as second in command and said, I want you to be the one who manages this situation and gets us through this problem we're about to face, Joseph didn't waste any time. He went right out to say, here, okay, I have a plan of attack. It's we collect one-fifth of the crops, but I need to go survey the land and see what we got, what, we're, what are we working with, and, and begin immediately taking charge on, on uh, taking action rather of tackling the problem that was in front of them. When we consistently and persistently take action in overcoming our obstacles, we separate ourselves from the vast majority who fail to do so. See, if you're willing to do the hard work and go through the obstacles that you're faced with, you're, you're, you have crowds of people on this side of your obstacle, but once you've pushed through and gone through and, and gone to the other side of the obstacle, you'll find that it's a lot less crowded on the other side of your obstacle, which gives you an advantage when you're going through stuff. I'm, I'm thinking of a, a couple in our church by the name of Tim and Paige Schaefer. Tim and Paige have been friends of mine for a while, and uh, for the last four to six weeks, I've been kind of watching their story from the sideline as they actually are faced with many great obstacles, and, and I had a chance recently to sit down with them and connect and talk through their story, and uh, I, I want to share that with you. So right now, i just like to, to uh, share Tim and Paige's story with you. So here's my conversation with them. Well, uh, Tim and Paige, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules. I know right now you're actually pretty busy, but I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule just to have a conversation with me. I miss being with you guys in person. I guess this is the next best thing. But for the, the, a lot of people, I'm sure, don't really know, you guys know your story. Maybe just quickly share with us uh, who you are and what you guys are up to. What do you guys got going on in your life? Um, we both work at uh, Schaefer Art Studio together. Uh, we make um, gifts for people. Um, so we make wood signs and journals, and um, uh, that's the best part about it. We sell everything on Etsy and Amazon, So, um, but that's basically what we do. Yep. How long have you guys been doing that? About five years. Yep. Five years. Awesome. And you guys, so you guys are fully self-employed. Yes. Completely. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, Paige, we had a conversation, I don't know, it was about six weeks ago about you guys had some incredible opportunities through Amazon because what you guys do that they, they were kind of showcasing some of your guys' stuff and things were like almost like at a peak in terms of, wow, everything's great. And then something else happened called COVID-19. Tell, tell me about that. Like, how has that journey been playing out for you guys? Um, well, 
you know, like you said, we had this amazing opportunity. Amazon flew us down to LA and was interviewing us and showcasing us. And it was, we got interviewed by K2 News, but then mm-hmm. that got buried because that was the mm-hmm. night coronavirus hit Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then sales just stalled, like literally no sales for two weeks. And, you know, news is coming out saying, okay, you're going to be quarantined for 60 days. Nothing's happening. We have no other source of income. Um, so it was really scary at first. That Very is scary, especially because that's, that's your, your livelihood, right? Right. Yeah, we support our family. We were able to work together. So, yeah, it was very frightening at first. Yeah, and, and along with that, tell me a little bit about what else has been going on in your life uh, kind of parallel to that. Uh, so, uh, my dad is uh, is ninety, going to be ninety one years old pretty soon. We've gone back and seen him once a month for a while, um, but almost immediately once we got back, my flight to go see him was canceled on the return and the uh, uh, departure, everything. And uh, so we're rebooking that, but it's really tough times because he's totally in quarantine in Illinois as well. So even if I was able to go, putting his life at risk would be too, the, the, it would too, be too great compared to the reward. So, uh, you know, it's really tough because he's the finest man I've ever met, you know, and, uh, that's tough. And then in the middle of it all, uh, at, or Taylor, uh, flew to, um, Florida and, uh, kind of a last minute decision mm-hmm. in the middle of it. And, um, so, and then, but since then she's flown back and is yeah. here again with us. So, yay. Taylor is your 23 year old daughter. Like, yeah, she's 23 a month, and you know it was very scary at the time. I um, didn't want her to go. I was afraid for her to go, uh, just that she would pick up the virus or you know put his family at risk. And actually, that night, I mean, we tried everything to kind of talk her out of it, but she's 22 and an adult, and you know she bought her ticket. And <laughs> yeah. God just revealed to me like every time He's protected her over the last 22 years, and it. You know, it was like, hey, if I can protect her in that, I can protect her in this. So I kept on telling her that uh, Taylor's half you and half me. There's uh, which means that she's going to do exactly what we would do at her age, which is what she did. Yeah. So, you know, what and can it's you do? actually ended up to be a wonderful thing because yes. his family um, yes. believe in Jesus and she actually attended an online church service, which yeah. is like the first time in six years and she was happy and having fun with his family and so it you know he used it for something amazing yeah that's cool and and when we say he i don't know if we remember we said that but that her boyfriend right and yeah her boyfriend and and her family or his family she stayed with his family and him and i think it was a great choice but at the time it seemed really scary so tell me what was going through your guys's minds through this process like all in a pretty tight window business just kind of tanks Tim, your dad, who's, whose health isn't all the best right now, um, you were looking to maybe be even one of the last times you get to actually see him in person. You're now not able to see him because he, he's in quarantine. Your flight gets canceled. And then your daughter, for the first time ever, flies a coop. <laughs> and she's gone on the other side of the nation, like literally in Florida, for I was like two weeks or something like that, right? Is that correct? Like a month. A month. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so what, like, how were you guys going? How did you guys handle that struggle? And it was weird, you know, if you think about being uh, locked in your home, uh, when one daughter leaves, 25% of your population's gone. <laughs> so at the time, it was really, really scary. But what was interesting about it is what you realize uh, with uh, just listening to what God's telling you is that, listen, you know what, you may not have this, but I have this. I got this. And we just put our faith in, uh, in, in what God was telling us the whole time. Every time we faced disaster or a huge obstacle, um, we were then blessed with the reward of seeing that obstacle through. Um, with Taylor, her smile on FaceTime was wide open. Um, she is so happy uh, and, uh, and just absolutely fun with that. I'm gonna see my dad again. Once I can travel, I can travel. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, our business blew up where people were just absolutely buying signs left and right and multiple orders. And, oh my goodness, you know, double Christmas in, uh, in, you know, April, gosh, is it April? (laughs) (laughs) 
anyway, so already whatever April. day or month it is right now, my goodness. But yeah. anyway, we were blessed. Uh, so our, our uh, instead of, it was a challenge. We, we really were looking at it as, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But, you know, um, we just we didn't focus on the fear of it and uh, like then we we're choice. blessed beyond we're we saying it's choice. like a choice you know it's yeah. a choice on how you respond to situations and I think as a person our first is fear mm -hmm. but you choose to trust God and know that he's faithful and that you know he's helped me in the past he's been with me in the past he's with me now he's going to make something beautiful out of this time even if it's um, a hard time I don't we've been listening to mm -hmm. uh, lore story blessings and it's just saying like what if the you know our blessings and your mercies are all the raindrops that fall in our life so like all the hard things in our life is absolutely everything we've learned the most from and also the way we've been able to bless other people yeah. so you know we've been through things in life that you know only i can understand because i've walked that road and i'm able to show love and compassion to someone else because of that mm -hmm. That's cool. That's cool. It's been fun watching you guys from the sideline. I remember, Paige, I called you after I heard about the stimulus package thing. I was, oh, this would be great for their business because I know things had tanked on Amazon. And you had already, you were already into it. You like knew everything you need to know and had already filed all that stuff. And just like you guys just plugging away and you always have this upbeat spirit about you, even though I know you were dealing with a lot at that time. And I know you're still going through that journey, that struggle. You know, Tim, you still have not yet seen your dad and you're looking forward to that opportunity. Exactly. But you, but, you yeah, we're look, I mean, it makes you look forward to it even more. Yeah, it does. And you've had opportunities to connect with them on Facebook, or not Facebook, FaceTime. Is that correct? Yeah. And, uh, and th that's been awesome, you know. And um, also Paige uh, and I have been using Zoom to connect with our families. And it's a, mm -hmm. you know, the, the TV might not be on, but other devices and electronics are on for us to make connection with people that we need to connect with and to spread mm -hmm. uh, some, some um, hope you know, yes. uh, through this whole thing. Yes. So and Paige is only talking about her successes because the other day she gave me a haircut and I've never <laughs> been more motivated to stay in my house ever. Uh, Did she threaten you? I could put it up and then, around. yeah, I look like the lead singer to Flock of Seagulls, the <laughs> great 80s band. So I didn't go out and I chose not to go out because I didn't want to scare small children. <laughs> Well, I got one last kind of question for you guys. Uh, we're on the on the other side of some of what you've gone through. What are what is there a single lesson or maybe a, a couple lessons that you've learned through this process in the last four to six weeks? I think just you know wherever God has called you to move forward in that. You know, I had was talking to you about this um, worship journaling book that I felt God calling me to do. Yeah. So the first two weeks when it was dead, it was like, okay, now I actually have time to do this. And it's been, you know, something that I felt God had called me to do. And it's become such a huge blessing to me. And, you know, now the group has grown and my sister's doing it and she's in Illinois and a friend's doing it in Texas. And so people all over the country are starting to be blessed through this thing that God's called me to do. Which and tell for those who don't know what that is, so what is that? What are you doing? Oh, okay, so Bible art journaling is just a form of worship, and it's incorporating art um, and very easy art. It's definitely I tell people if you've ever painted a wall or if you've ever said a prayer, you can do this. Be stick figures for me. It totally. It's it's um, it's just incorporating art and prayers and worshiping God. And so we're taking worship songs and then pulling out the verses that we learn about God's characteristics from that. And then I teach a very simple, easy painting, and you can follow along at home, watch the videos, and then you write in the journal. Because we're saying, you know, the purpose of getting God's word, when you write it, you learn it 70 times more than if you just hear it. And so the purpose is to get God's word in our heart so that it then comes out of us. That's and cool. it, Mike, uh, it really does. I can't explain it but uh, very well, but since Paige has been doing uh, Bible art journaling and having her uh, growth group through the church uh, in our living room, um, first of all, I, I don't think I ever see her walk around. She just floats around. But <laughs> this, uh, this uh, art form basically allows her to take uh, chaos and turn it into solace. And it's through uh, just being mindful and patient with uh, God's word. And it's, 
I, I, I don't know. I think that it's the balance there, and that's what she's focused on, and uh, it's pretty nice. So fun. That's very cool. Well, uh, thank you guys for taking some time to, to talk to me. And I, I, you're an inspiration to me. I hope you're an inspiration to everyone who gets to watch this. But keep plugging away. You guys are doing awesome. And I can't wait to hear the rest of the story as mm -hmm. things unfold for you. So thank you very much. And, and I look forward to talking to you guys again soon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Bye, guys. Well, I hope that Tim and Paige's story inspires you like it has inspired me. It's, it's fun. The story, story is not in. It's still being written, but it's fun to watch from the sidelines and see how, as they've been persistently going through the obstacles that they're facing and coming through stronger on the other side and seeing how God is working their life, I just am inspired by that and hope that inspires you too. I want to pull us back to our worksheet. As we look at, we already identified our obstacle in step one, and we came up with three possible solutions in step two. Now it's time to take action. My question here is, how will I take action this week to overcome this obstacle? What is the most effective, best step that you can take, the first step that you can take right now to overcome the obstacles that you are currently faced with? And that's, we just need to go out there and do that. I'll remind you this famous quote you've heard before, that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The only way for us to overcome the obstacles is take a step towards them. So what is that first step that you need to take? Now, after taking action, we will eventually emerge on the other side of our obstacle. But at this time, it's time for step four, and that is this. We need to reflect on the benefit. So we've gone through an obstacle. We need to reflect on the benefit. And I don't want you to skip this step. This is super important because this is where the lessons are learned. This is where we find opportunities we didn't know existed, is when we're going through circumstances that are difficult and hard to face as challenges. Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein says that, that opportunities are revealed in the middle of our difficulties that is where we need to find the lessons that we learn through going through these obstacles. In fact, evaluated experience leads to insight. And those insights are nuggets of wisdom that help us and inform us as we go through future obstacles that lie ahead of us. Without this step, by the way, we might find ourselves in repeat mode when we're faced with the same or similar obstacles. Finding ourselves repeating the same mistakes, find ourselves stressed out the same way, find ourselves too, too uh, um, scared to take the risk to move out because we didn't learn from the lessons from past obstacles. And so I encourage you, you've got to learn those lessons. In the story of Joseph, Joseph, um, after um, he becomes second in command and he basically saves the day for Egypt, his brothers and his dad become reunited, him through, reunited to him through that story. And his dad's towards the end of his life. And as his dad ends his, or comes to the end of his life and passes away, Joseph's brothers are really worried. Because if you remember, back in the beginning of the story, it was them who sold their brother into slavery. And so they're worried that Joseph, now that dad's gone, might seek retribution or revenge for their, the actions. They, that basically took him from being a 17-year-old boy and pushed him into the slave trade he was on a 13-year journey through all those obstacles, going into prison and then coming out on the other side, becoming second command in Egypt. It says that he was 30 years old by the time he gets to that. So we're talking a 13-year journey of going through these obstacles. Joseph could easily have, have wanted to seek revenge on his brothers, but instead he, he gained insight from the obstacles that he went through. And he shares that insight with his brothers. He says in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of of many people. Wow, how insightful is that? What wisdom he gained from going through his obstacles. Instead of making himself bitter going through his obstacles, he made himself better and he was able to build on them as opposed to being buried by them. And that is what we have to do when we go through obstacles. Learn from Joseph and what are the insights? What are the nuggets that we can learn from those that can help us moving through into the future? By the way, I believe that the biggest obstacles in our lives are the barriers that we create in our own mind. We, in fact, become our worst enemy because we don't get out of our own way when it comes to obstacles. We scare ourselves. We, we talk ourselves out of going forward and facing the obstacles that we're, we're faced with. And I think when we come back to the worksheet, this last step, which, by the way, this is the one step you probably can't fill out on the worksheet today because you have to get through the obstacle before you can gain insights from it. And so um, I say fill out the first three and then hang on to the sheet, come back to this last one. But the question I ask are, what are the benefits I have gained by facing this obstacle? And don't forget to come back and fill that in. Maybe it's just one big benefit. Maybe it's a small benefit. Maybe there's multiple benefits, but you need to come back and write down the lessons that are learned because that is how you gain opportunity to move forward as you face future obstacles. I also want to point out to you in your notes, I've written down three, or three benefits, rather, I believe that are universal to any obstacles that we face. And the first one is this, obstacles introduce us to opportunities. Now, that's the whole topic of today's talk, so I'm not going to dive into that, but I do want to share with you the words from the author James in the New Testament. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, 
When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, it is by overcoming obstacles that you develop new skills and new ways of handling what the rest of your life has in store for you. The second universal benefit I believe that we gain from obstacles is that obstacles strengthen your character. Obstacles strengthen your and my character. Listen to what the author Paul says in the New Testament in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. See, Paul says, don't look at the temporary, temporary nature of your obstacles. I know it's tough, but, but persevere. Go through those obstacles. You're going to emerge stronger on the other side, which is going to set you up because it's going to de- define and develop your character in big ways. Our character shapes the way we respond to obstacles. In fact, the author and um, a speaker, John Maxwell, says life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Can you imagine if any uh, investment you were going to make in your life how you were in control of 90% of the outcome, how positive you would be in terms of going forward and making that investment. That's the same as true with the obstacles that we're facing. It's, it's not the obstacle that determines the outcome. It's, ni- it's the 90% that we have control of how we're going to handle the circumstances we're faced with. Strong character provides a tremendous advantage for facing future obstacles. I hope you don't miss that. The third and last benefit that I want to point out that's universal to all obstacles we face is that obstacles remind us to depend on God. I believe this is probably the most important thing we can learn when it comes to obstacles. It reminds us to depend on God. You see, when everything is smooth sailing, when everything is going our way, when it feels like we we have the ability and the power to control our situation, we begin to rely less and less on God, less and less on the people that are are part of our lives that are helping us to accomplish what we're accomplishing. We begin to get this God complex of our own. We begin to build up pride inside of us, and we begin to think that we can do this all on our own. And so we don't need God in our life, and so we just kind of rely on him less and less. And I know for me, the times where I've relied most on God in my situations are the time where I, I, I can sense my limits. I feel like the limits are there, or I feel like there's just no way I could possibly get through this situation if it isn't for God intervening and God stepping in and helping me through it. And it causes me to greatly depend on God. And even in this last year, there have been many opportunities for me where obstacles I was faced with, I didn't know how I was going to overcome them. And it caused me to depend on God more and to to draw closer to Him and rely on Him. And one of those such obstacles is uh, something that happened recently is that you may have heard us on March 8th, I uh, shared in one of our messages that we believe as Westside Community Church, which is a church of three campuses. It's the Aloha campus, the Tiger campus, and we are the Tannisborn campus. And we decided, we felt led by God that the, the best and most effective thing we can do to reach our respective communities is for each one of those campuses to become autonomous, independently operating churches. And so I mentioned that on March 8th. And then if you remember, right around that time, um, the, all the COVID-19 social dis- distancing, all that stuff became very prominent at that time. And so March 8th was the last time that we did live services. And so since then, uh, we've gone from me being campus pastor to teaching every six to eight weeks to now I am teaching every week to a video camera and um, also leading as lead pastor of this new church. And it's been an exciting and at the same time, uh, a very challenging journey where I have to do, learn to depend on God through this process. And God has been so faithful in guiding us through this process. And it's been great to see as our church has kind of risen to the occasion, we've seen people come up and, and we've got like four blood drives that have been put on the schedule. Three of them have happened as of last Friday and all of them have been filled with people. People are coming out of the woodwork to give blood. We have another one on May 15th. By the way, if you want to get in on that, you can sign up for it on your connection card, but do it today because that blood drive is filling up very quickly as well. But people are just kind of rallying to the the cause and we're seeing um, things like we had our partner school, Quotama Elementary School, asked if we could help them to um, come up with some, collect some snacks to be able to deliver to the kids in the school. And I thought, man, in the wildest imagination, I thought maybe we'll be able to come up with a thousand snacks and kind of surprise the school with that. But instead, you guys rose to the occasion and over 5,000 snacks were collected for those kids in one week. And so I'm just seeing great things like that happen. I want to say that not only do obstacles help me depend on God, but they remind me to have a heart of gratitude. And I am so grateful for you. I'm, re- I'm grateful for the fact that 
Um, our, our campus that is soon becoming a church is not uh, successful because of me or my wife. You may see us more prominently because of social distancing right now, but really it's the generosity and the commitment of you guys that make this happen. It's, it's we together who are allowing this success to happen and, and letting God work through us and guide us through this process. And so it's been very exciting to see that happen. I want to say thank you for your generosity Thank you for your willingness to step in and help out with things like the blood drive and the snacks. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your prayers, because I hear often from you that you guys are doing that. And it's such a life-giving thing to our church. I believe because of that, that we are positioned in a greater place than we've ever been. And God is, is allowing more momentum to happen in our church than ever in the history of our six years of our campus. We're seeing moment, more momentum as a result of what's going on right now. And it's really your faithfulness and, and letting God work through us and being dependent on God through this process. So I just want to thanks, say thanks for that. And by the way, if you want to hear more about the journey that we're on to becoming our own church, um, next Sunday evening, we're going to do an event called The Big Reveal. And if you want to be a part of that, you can, you can only do that by getting to your connection card form and checking that box. We'll send you the information to be a part of that. But we'll be sharing on there um, the, the, like the latest information. We'll be talking about where we're at in that transition process. We'll be revealing the new name for our church. And we'll also uh, have a time for Q&A on there as well. So I encourage you to, to jump in on that. But uh, that's just one, one obstacle that I know I'm going through currently that I just, it, to see the way God works through these things, it's just amazing. It causes me to depend more on him and gain more strength through him through the process. Now, um, if I could get you to remember one thing from our talk today, I've shared a lot with you. I've, I've given you a lot of information, but if I get you to remember one thing, it would be this. As you face the current situation that you're faced with, depend on God like you never have before. Depend on God like you never have before. If you forget everything else I say today, but you remember that, that is the thing I want you to catch. Depend on God like you never have before because that is the secret to coming through uh, in an advantageous way on the other side of the obstacles that we're faced with. Probably some of the best words that I can give you right now to comfort you through this crisis that we're all going through together, the obstacles and adversity that you're faced with is this. It's the words of Jesus written down by the author Matthew, who was one of Jesus' disciples. He says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I got a question for you. Would you like God to carry your burdens? What is it that you're carrying right now that it's just like it's just weighing you down? Do you, would you want him to carry those for you? He'll do that for you, but there's a catch. The catch is this. You have to let him. You have to release it. If you're holding those burdens tight-fisted, you have to open those fists up, relax them, and open up and let God take those burdens because he wants to but he's not going to take them from you. He's going to wait for you to release them to him. You know, we heard the story of Tim and Paige earlier. I hope that was inspiring to you, but there's another person I want to tell you about from our church that's inspired me specifically this week. There's a lady by the name of Tina Stevens who has been a part of, of Westside for many years. In fact, when we started this campus over six years ago, she was one of the charter kids team volunteers. She's been a part of the kids team this whole time. And Tina has faithfully volunteered in the kids' program with a great attitude. She's also been a part of our program re re, uh, recycling and assembly team, and she's done that faithfully. There's a little thing about Tina that you need to know, and that is that Tina, for her entire adult life, suffered from a very chronic, very debilitating chronic illness. I don't know much about it. It's, it's a degenerative disease called Crest Syndrome. And for her whole adult life, she struggled. As long as I've known Tina, she struggled physically. And uh, Tina has always always when she shows up she never talks about her pain she never complains about the pain that she's in although you can see that she's in it and she's always had a positive attitude and a great sense of humor in fact my wife and i she broke her hip and we went up to see her in the hospital about six months ago and she was just cracking jokes left and right while she's in the hospital recovering from hip surgery she's always had a positive upbeat attitude and i don't know anybody else including myself who has even come close to having to, to face the kind of obstacles that she's faced and she faces them faithfully. She faces them head on. She goes through them with a good attitude and she always emerges on the other side. And the thing that I know for, for Tina that has been her strength this time is her dependence on God. She's always been dependent on God. In fact, she was tuned into our services last week on April 19th and she turned in a three-word prayer request asking God for perseverance and strength. 
You know, Tina just found out about four to six weeks ago. The doctor said, you know, I don't think there's anything else we can do for you. Your, your health is diminishing. We're going to give you about six months to live. And I found out unexpectedly on Tuesday afternoon, April 21st, that Tina lost her battle to this illness that she was facing, and she passed away. But Tina's legacy lives on. She's an inspiration to me, and I hope that she's an inspiration to you. And if you're someone who's watching right now, and, and you've never had a relationship with God, I want you to have a relationship like Tina had. Because although she went through these debilitating illnesses and had to overcome all these obstacles, Tina always set her eyes on God and got her strength and gained her strength from God and, and, and really just lived a, a happy life in spite of all the, the circumstances that she had to deal with. And if today you've never had a relationship with God like that, I want to invite you to start one with God today. You know, God made you to love you. He loves you. He loves me. And he wants to have that kind of a relationship with you. And if, if that's you today, you want God to lift your heavy burdens. You want him to take the weight off your shoulders and to carry it from this point forward. If you want him to be on your team, to be close in relationship with you as you live forward in your life, I'm going to say a prayer in just a moment that's a quick, simple prayer. And you'll have the opportunity that time, if you'd like to, to just, as I say it out loud, to say it silently in your, in your own heart as a way of accepting God in your life for the very first time, saying, God, I don't have all the answers. I don't have it all figured out, but I want what Tina had. I want that kind of enduring perseverance, regardless of my circumstances, because I depend on you, because my strength comes from you. I want a relationship with you today. I believe you. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins as we celebrated that story just two weeks ago for Easter. And I want you to be in my life. I don't, I don't know, I don't, I'm not going get to like, get it right every time from this point forward, but I would do the best I can to follow you. I want your, your plan for my life to, to lead me forward, to guide my steps into the purpose and, and the future that you have in store for me. And if that's you, follow along with me as I say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I desire a relationship with you Please forgive my sins. Today I'm handing my burdens over to you. Give me rest for my soul. Jesus, save me and make me new. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and serve you the rest of my life. Use me to shine your light, to show your love, and to spread your hope. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. God, I don't know what each person is going through today, but I'd like to pray for everyone watching that you would encourage them through today's talk. Help them to not just be encouraged, but that they would also be compelled to do something about their current circumstances. Give each person clarity on, on how to overcome the obstacles that they are faced with. Allow them to have the boldness to not just know what to do, but to actually take action and push through the obstacles that they are currently faced with. More than anything else, help each person to be drawn to you, to depend on you, to never forget that they need you and that they can rely on you to help them through their current problems. Thank you, God. Amen.